Hi guys. Well, here we are at chapter eight, and this is going to be a kind of a long one. I really hope I'm going to try to bust through this and hope we don't get shut down. So let me get right in to chapter eight, all aboard the beer boat. We're going to start with a quote from Michael Lunig in The Road Less Traveled. <clears throat> God be with those who explore the cause of understanding, whose search takes them far from what is familiar and comfortable and leads them into danger or terrifying loneliness. Let us try to understand their sometimes strange or difficult ways. They're confronting an unusual language the uncommon life of their emotions, for they have been affected and shaped and changed by their struggle at the frontiers of a wild darkness, just as we may be affected, shaped and changed by the insights they bring back to us. Bless them with strength and peace. Amen. Thank you, Brother Michael, for the Traveler's Prayer which will bring us back to Salvation Peru, the crack of dawn on Friday, May 29th, 2009, after the Grand Fiesta of the night before. <clears throat> Scattered sounds of shattering beer bottles and the regretful moans of staggering drunks were beginning to replace the flagging ruckus of the American stars who were finally beginning to set as Friday morning's weak sun began to rise. As furtively as I could, I picked my way through the quagmire of broken glass and comatose near corpses, a couple of which were sprawled unconscious in the hotel courtyard to drag my bag of cannonballs through the dark and muddy streets to the bus. I was somewhat put out to find my salvation from Salvacion was not the same big burly bus that had carried me from Pilcapata to Atalaya, but some dilapidated pipsqueak overgrown beer can with the ground clearance, read boulder clearance, of a Cadillac. The amazingly perky young captain of this dubious vessel seemed confident and courageous, however, so I shrugged off my gringo irritation and settled into the best seat on the dark, empty bus. The bus did not stay empty for long. Over the next half hour, a raggle-taggle band of Amazon Indians approximately 90% of whom were women with small children attached to them like remoras to sharks, straggled onto the bus. My companions for the three-hour, 30-mile journey were a plump, stern-faced woman who could have been 21 or 42 and her four-year-old son, whose main goal in life was to pick a particularly hard-to-reach booger out of his left nostril. In addition to a child, it seemed like every woman on the bus was loaded down with one to three cardboard cartons of canned condensed milk, which they conveniently piled in the aisle between the seats. The bus was more of a milk truck than a passenger van before we pulled out. Although there were still a dozen or so seats remaining, and it was ten minutes before our scheduled six o'clock departure time, the eager driver tooted his horn and fired up the engine with a great ceremony. With squeals of farewell to friends and well-wishers, we set off, set off down the concrete boulevard to go less than two blocks where the entire procedure, complete with milk loading, replaced itself. Every seat was full by this time, and the aisle was jammed with cartons of canned milk as we set off a second time. The driver abandoned the smooth, wide boulevard. <clears throat> uh, the was 
Good Lord. Uh, anyway, I don't know what's going on with my computer, guys. The driver abandoned the smooth, wide main street and navigated his way slowly through the narrow, muddy detour of side streets, alert for any drunks who may have passed out in the middle of the road. Five minutes later, when we arrived at the point where the concrete boulevard was supposed to have connected up with the highway to Shintoya, we stopped to pick up yet another half dozen passengers. The newcomers were, of course, none too pleased to find all the seats taken and every available square inch of standing room taken up by cartons of canned milk. Complaints and insults were hurled about the bus in some angry, unrecognizable Indian dialect, but the jovial driver managed to quash the rising revolt by quickly making seats out of the bulky cartons themselves. Everyone thus settled, we finally pulled out of Salvacion. <clears throat> Minutes later, we were clipping along a well-maintained, broad, graveled highway at what must have been 30, if not 40, miles per hour. How I wondered as I watched the ravaged rainforest scenery roll by outside my foggy window, how could it possibly take three hours to take a lousy 30-mile trip on such a fine roadway? <clears throat> The answer to that rhetorical question, like the answer to so many riddles in Peru, came in about 10 minutes when we arrived at the first of a dozen or so river crossings that would punctuate our odyssey that morning. I say river crossing instead of bridge for the simple reason that there are no more bridges or apparently even the faintest hope of building any bridges in the foreseeable future once you have crossed the one and only bridge over the Rio Madre de Dios and Pilcapata. This is a good thing, of course, for anyone not on a bus trying to cross a river at flood stage between Pilcapata and Chantoya, Peru. As our lowrider city bus began churning not across but directly up the middle of a rain-swollen rock-strewn riverbed that had abandoned all traces of being or having ever been a roadway, it began to dawn on me what I was witnessing. Wisely not wanting to repeat the same embarrassing, costly blunder of Salvacion's Boulevard to Nowhere, the highway engineers had opted not to push a totally completed road, i.e. one complete with bridges, piece by piece into the jungle in their hurry to get to Itawania and ultimately on to Puerto Maldonado and Brazil and the U.S. and last, but by no means least, China. Instead, this time they had decided to connect the dots, in this case the dots being spots on their optimistic maps indicating where bridges would have been in a perfect world with, a, with stretches of well-built, well-maintained highway between the dots. This sadistic system of intermittent rewards and punishments worked out just fine for those lucky enough or wealthy enough to afford four-wheel drive vehicles to negotiate the punishing river crossings. For everyone else, well, if you were crazy enough to drive a city bus through a dozen rain-swollen This computer, I am sorry guys, this computer is going to be jumpy today. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, I am very sorry. I'm going to put this dog up. Uh, maybe that will help. <clears throat> Alright, sorry about this, but I don't know how to edit it out. Uh, Alright. 
Instead, this time they had decided to connect the dots, in this case the dots being spots on their optimistic maps indicating where bridges would have been in a perfect world with stretches of well-built, well-maintained highway between the dots. This sadistic system of intermittent rewards and punishments worked just fine for those lucky enough or wealthy enough to afford four-wheel drive vehicles to negotiate the punishing river crossings. For everyone else, well, if you were crazy enough to drive a city bus through a dozen rain-swollen, bridgeless jungle rivers and you got stuck, that was your problem and not the highway departments. At some of these crossings, our gambler of a driver would churn right on through, grinding gears and spraying gravel as he went. At more dubious challenges, he would send his female assistant, presumably his wife, out into the roiling water on a recon mission. If she were not swept away to her death, and her calf-high rubber boots did not fill with water, he would press on. If her boots did fill with water, the two of them would splash around in the river, placing flat stones by hand until they physically raised the stream bed enough to allow a one-time passage. This air sat's husband and wife bridge building enterprise was just efficient enough to get us squarely to the middle of downtown East Bumblefuck, Peru when we encountered our Waterloo, a swirling, a swirling frothing morass of muddy water and bowling ball sized stones that stretch some 100 feet across to the far bank. The Herculean challenge that was clearly beyond the meager scope of mom and pop bridge building operation and for a minute or two I was depressed to think that, that we were going to have to retreat and defeat back to Salvacion. Miraculously Hercules appeared out of nowhere to rescue us but first appeared to be some cast off derelict planet-eating relic from the rubber boom of a century ago mushroomed to life and an and amid an explosion of blue smoke. With the Sisyphean tenacity of a lone termite devouring a redwood log, the ancient bag of rusty bones got down to the impossibly optimistic business of carving a negotiable, if tenuous, temporary bridge of loose river stone. It was actually more of a temporary dam to hold back the water for five minutes, literally lowering the water level below the dam to a passable level than an actual bridge. If we had bogged down midstream, I am certain the oncoming wall of water from the breached dam would have swept us to our deaths in the watery maw of the Mother of God. Remarkably enough, we did not bog down, and moments later we were cruising down the highway again. During our stopover at the river crossing, a steady rain had set in. This posed no problem when the bus was chugging uphill, but every time we would crest a hill and start heading down toward our next brush with death, a small river of water would run down the edge of the roof of the bus and pour directly through a crack in my window, soaking my left knee. Despite everything I tried to stem this flood, I was soon soaked from mid-thigh to ankle. My annoyance at this situation was the highest form of entertainment for the four-year-old booger miner beside me. At some point on our soggy journey, we paused at some particularly squalid collection of rough plank tin-roofed hovels. 
the one literal bright spot in this island of despair was a multicolored metal sign which appeared to have been posted in the past few days announcing the Community Organic Garden, below which were painted the names and logos of several U.S.-based environmental organizations, just in case you were wondering where your well-meaning charitable donations are going. Behind this gaily colored sign, surrounded by a tattered remnant of rusty chicken wire, sat perhaps a quarter acre of mud puddles and rocks unblemished by so much as one blade of green grass, much less a garden, organic or otherwise. Stepping on the bus was a heavy-set Indian woman wearing a t-shirt that read, The future of the Amazon is in our hands. Below the words was a drawing of Mother Earth nestled in a pair of loving human hands. I thought to myself, shouldn't that drawing be the other way around? How much dark irony could one person take in one morning. Right on schedule at 9 a.m., we, we chugged into the hellhole of Shintuya, Peru, a truly desperate shanty town that made Salvacion and Atalaya look like Carmel by the sea in comparison. I, I paid our cheerful driver my dollar sixty six fare and hurried off the bus with my bag of cannonballs. Besides me, the only people heading down river were a bubbly trio of Piro Indian women. They were school teachers from a little village downstream called Diamante, and they were returning victorious from a trip to Cusco, laden down with several heavy boxes of Spanish textbooks and other school supplies. Banding together, we headed out in search of a boat for the 40-minute trip to Itawania. At least six people assured us that there were no boats, despite the fact that we could count six of them. A shack-by-shack -shack search of the village finally produced a surly boat captain who agreed to take us for seven dollars each. We ponied up the cash four times the price of our three-hour bus ride. Grumbling, our captain rigged up his pecky pecky, essentially a lawnmower engine with an eight foot propeller shaft attached to a 20 foot dugout canoe, and we pushed off into the muddy waters of the Mother of God. 30 seconds into our voyage, we were swallowed up by the watery, roadless wilderness. Thick stands of bamboo and groves of graceful umbrella leaves, sacropia trees, fringed the pebble-strewn sandbars along the bank of the muddy river. To our left, misty ridges of forested mountains rolled off into the wilderness of Manu National Park. To our right, the lowland rainforest of the Amarakari Cultural Reserve what we would call an Indian reservation, spread almost to Puerto Maldonado. We passed occasional tiger herons and giant white egrets standing statue still at their favorite fishing holes. As the warm morning sun played hide and seek through the scattered thunderheads, the stresses of the morning's punishing bus ride melted away and it finally began to hit me that I really was in the Peruvian Amazon in a motorized canoe with four Indians. 
This pathetic little gringo fantasy was shattered like a Fabergé egg being hurled against a brick wall when we pulled into the surreal center of existential hell known as Itawania, Peru. The only discernible difference between the reality of this end-of-the-road shithole and the fictional setting of Captain Kurtz's macabre outpost in Apocalypse Now was the lack of rotting corpses swinging from poles. Though a flock of vultures was there waiting, just in case any showed up, Otherwise, the hodgepodge collection of battered oil drums, stacks of logs, and rough-hewn lumber, the real corpses, rotting garbage, mud, and mangy mutts strewn haphazardly around the steep riverbank had all the welcoming allure of a strip mine, and I hadn't even gotten out of the boat yet, after Atalaya, Salvacion, and Shintuya, I'm not sure what I was expecting to find at the literal, for now, end of the road in the Peruvian Amazon. Club Med, perhaps? I guess all the talk about cargo boats had lull lulled me into the laughable illusion that this river port might have something vaguely resembling a dock. You know, something made out of treated timbers and concrete where cargo boats could tie up to the dock to be filled from trucks parked a few feet away. Well, the dock turned out to be a tiny eroded spit of gravel tucked between a dangerous rapid on one side and an even more dangerous near vertical river bank perhaps 40 feet high on the other bank. As it did at every other river bank east of Pilcapata, the highway dead-ended abruptly at the top of this cliff leaving it to the hapless boat captains to figure out how to get their heavy loads from their trucks to their cargo boats bobbing in the perilous rapids below. As sickened as I was by the freshly milled slabs of rush-cut timbers, each one of which had to weigh a half ton or more, I was almost sorry I wasn't able to witness the superhuman lumber boat loading challenge. At this point, it was still not yet noon, and I was facing my own personal superhuman challenge of, hosting, of hoisting my heavy bag of cannonballs up the treacherous muddy path to find a, a hot meal, hopefully of Picuro, and a room at the Bates Motel. The depressing thought of spending even one night in this armpit held all the allure of bedding down with a nest of pit vipers. On the verge of existential despair, I noticed Actually, it was pointed out to me by the trio of vivacious young school teachers that our little pecky pecky was not the only boat moored to the spit of gravel, not 20 feet upstream, rocking ominously in the rapids, was our dubious passport to freedom, the Barco de Cerveza, otherwise known as the local beer boat, gearing up for its Friday afternoon run down the Madre de Dios. Mother of God was right! Assigned the unenviable task of loading the unsteady 40-foot open boat with what we estimated to be more than a thousand liter bottles of beer were two teenaged Indian boys who accepted their cruel fate Twelve bottles, perhaps 35 pounds at a time. As they each had only one sack, they would climb the steep bank to the waiting truck, load their fragile cargo, descend the muddy trail, 
carefully stack the bottles horizontally on top of each other in neat rows, then repeat the process over and over and over again until all the precious liquid had been transferred from roadway to river. Apparently, they had been at this ant-like process since dawn and were blessedly almost finished with their morning's workload by the time we arrived. All that was left to pack was perhaps 100 two-liter bottles of tooth-rotting Ica Cola and a couple hundred rolls of toilet paper. By the time the cargo was loaded, the gunnels of the two-foot deep boat cleared the swirling surface by about three inches. By the same mysterious signal that tells Peruvian Indians it's time to board a bus was given, a swarm of excited natives appeared out of thin air and began clambering over the boat in search of secure seating among the beer bottles. I defended my two square feet of personal space between two walls of bottles near the front of the boat and arranged a cozy nest for myself and the cutest of the three school teachers out of my bag of cannonballs. This arrangement being the closest thing to an intimate encounter with a female your celibate correspondent has had in the year 2009. To protect the 13 passengers from the imminent thunderstorm that was brewing, the officious young first mate offered us a blue tarp. With no further ado, including no offer of life jackets, because there were no life jackets to offer, one of the kids untied us from the dock and pushed our wildly rocking boat out into the churning waters of the Mother of God River. It was not until the moment that the other kid yanked the cord, the, the cord of the flashy new Yamaha 60-horse outboard engine that I realized our boat was to be piloted by some teenaged young hellion who should have been in school and not shooting rapids down a rain-swollen ri rain river in a life-jacketless rocking horse full of beer not to mention more than a dozen passengers. But such are the chances taken by today's self-sufficient, i.e. cheapskate, Amazonian traveler, and I had nobody but myself to blame for my demise by drowning. The young first mate assured me it was a 90-minute trip to our destination, the jungle outpost of Boca Manu, so I settled into my last hour or so of life full of prurient Pocahontas fantasies concerning the giggling young school teacher snuggled in beside me. Once again, we were enveloped in the majestic loving arms of the Mother of God, while the hellish vision of Itawania retreated into mist-shrouded obscurity. The river spread itself out into an ever-widening maze of confusing rock-strewn channels and islands as the last vestiges of the Andes petered out into a vast lowland rainforest that rolled on eastward almost to the Atlantic Ocean some 2,000 miles away as the McCall flies. Flotsam and, jet, flotsam and jetsam, consisting mostly of logs the size of steam engines, clogged some of the channels. Other times, our overloaded ark would scrape ominously over rough stones that sounded like they were ripping the belly out of our boat. More than once, the propeller ricocheted off some submerged death trap. Lording over this spectacular scenery of river 
jungle and sky, father-son continued to play hide-and-seek with the purple clouds, occasionally pouring rays of honey-colored light over the landscape. About halfway into our 90-minute journey, the sun grew tired of its game of hide-and-seek, and we went into per and went into permanent hide mode, but behind the now solid gunmetal gray blanket of clouds, up ahead, perhaps a kilometer away, an approaching wall of water was bearing down a down on us, and vice versa. Tormenta, tormenta! Howled the young first mate. Almost gleefully, he went into action, and 30 seconds later, my world went morpho butterfly blue as he raced to tie down the tarp over his precious cargo, the thousand beer bottle labels being more precious than his passengers. A few seconds later, I could feel myself being pelted by raindrops that felt the size of splattering grapes as we careened madly down the river through the storm. A deafening explosion of thunder from beyond the blue void sent the squealing young schoolteacher beside me burrowing into my armpit. As much as I was enjoying this romantic interlude, the air under the tarp was getting a wee bit thick. I teased open a small crack between the edge of the tarp and the gunwale and rode out the tormenta, watching a narrow slice of shoreline vegetation racing along the boat. The storm fizzled out just as our soaking wet young captain cut back on the throttle. We all emerged blinking like sleepy koala bears from beneath the meager shelter of the tarp just as we were coasting to a stop at a tiny beach at the bottom of a steep muddy footpath leading up the bank into the jungle. This, it turned out, was the outskirts of the Piro Indian village of Diamante, meaning it was the point that I would lose my companion. She and her two friends clambered out of the boat with their loads of school books, and like a love-struck running bear mooning for his little white dove, I waved goodbye to her forever and let the raging water take me down. According to my map and what our first mate had told me, it appeared the short trip from Diamante to Boca Manu should take about 20 minutes. Considering how ravenous I was after not eating for 20 hours, this would not be a moment too soon. We set off again, and I began preparing my bag of cannonballs for docking. We proceeded downstream for approximately 200 yards when our young captain aimed the boat directly toward shore and gunned the engine, purposefully beaching the floating liquor store onto a gravel bar perhaps 20 yards offshore from the collection of dilapidated huts known as Downtown Diamante. All I can figure was this was his way of protecting his valuable booty from land-based pirates. Without a word of explanation to us eight remaining passengers, the captain and the first mate plunged into the thigh-deep water and disappeared into Diamante, and there they remained for at least an hour, no doubt wolfing down a heaping plate of grilled picuro while my stomach ate my pancreas for lunch. The capacity of Peruvians to sit there, stone-faced and uncomplaining, in a beached boat for an hour when they are 20 minutes from their destination is truly awe-inspiring. 
I tried to let the iron-willed stoicism of my fellow patient passengers stem the tide of my rising gringo indignation at this abandonment by the crew, but I was ready to strangle the two impertinent little punks by the time they returned from their meal to wrestle their boat off the gravel bar. The cocky first mate gave me a tranquilo gringo hand signal to indicate we were just a river bend away from Boca Manu and we set off yet again directly upstream to the very spot we had let off the school teachers an hour before. Arrgh! And there, on a tiny beach in the middle of nowhere in the Peruvian Amazon, I witnessed one of the most remarkable business transaction I have ever seen. To fully grasp the high strangeness of this negotiation, you need to understand the utter abject poverty suffered by the purchasers. In this case, the Piro Indians of south southeastern Peru. Unless and until you have actually witnessed firsthand the unspeakable level of desperate poverty these people suffer, the level of existential hell they endure every day of their lives, you don't know what it looks like, not to mention what it feels like for a family of eight to scrape by in their dirt floor hovel on a dollar or two a day. These folks are poor, okay? <clears throat> With that gloomy socioeconomic scene as a backdrop to this story, consider this series of events. Our overloaded beer boat which I had arrogantly assumed was heading to the ritzy gringo eco-lodges downstream of Boca Manu, tied up to the tiny beach. We were met at the bottom of the steep path by this nervous, twitchy old man dressed in a filthy pair of cutoffs and an oil-stained t-shirt. It was plainly obvious by looking at this old fart that he did not have, had never had, and would never dream of having enough dinero to purchase the proverbial pot to pee in. But this afternoon, the old man wanted to purchase some cerveza, and not just a bottle of two, but five hundred liter bottles of beer. This outlandish request set off a buzz of excitement around the boat. The young captain demanded to see some evidence that the guy could put his money where his mouth was. Looking around nervously, the old man reached all the way in his shorts and pulled out a dog-choking wad of 2,300 soles, equivalent to about $850 in American greenbacks. <clears throat> and so, for the next solid hour, I sat there in that fucking boat while the two kids proceeded to unload 500 liters of beer onto the beach. My Virgo sense of efficiency was outraged at the cumbersome system of counting off 12 bottles at a time, having to start over time and time again to get their bearings when they could have simply called out 500 bottles from the neatly stacked, easy-to-count bottles carefully laid out in the boat, with perhaps 100 bottles to go. It started to rain again, and I just pulled the tarp up over my head in utter defeat. I did not stick it out again until we finally arrived at my soggy destination some four hours after beginning our 90-minute trip, 
and some 12 hours after I had walked out of my hotel room in Salvacion, perhaps 50 miles from where I now found myself stranded for another night. And guys, I think I'm going to break up this chapter. No, we're going to charge ahead, and I really hope we don't get cut off here uh, to wrap up chapter 8. <clears throat> I forked over my $10 fare, take that, Ernesto, and lugged my bag of cannonballs up the sleep slippery stairwell to the mysterious jungle clearing called Boca Manu, Mouth of Manu, referring to the fact that it is located where the Manu River empties into the Madre de Dios at the southeast corner of Manu National Park. As exhausted and, and wet and miserable as I was upon arrival, none of these conditions could compare to the ravenous hunger clawing at those internal organs that had not already been consumed by my own stomach hours before. I set off into the rain in search of Boca Manu's finest restaurant, sloshing through the slippery mud. The town consisted of perhaps a dozen tiny little stores selling exactly the same tiny little selection of merchandise to an even tinier little base of consumers, not one of which I ever witnessed making a purchase the whole time I was there. At one point during my treacherous trudge, I slipped in the mud and my bag of cannonballs slammed my funny bone into a rough wooden post. My consternation at my throbbing elbow was mollified by the recognition that the post was propping up Boca Manu's finest restaurant by virtue of its being Boca Manu's only restaurant. Recovering from the shock of seeing an actual customer walk through his door, the astonished proprietor advised me that he would be serving dinner at 6.30 p.m., some two hours away. He shrugged. I checked into the local hotel in the meantime. My $10 room for the night turned out to be a little thatch roof screen bungalow with private bathroom. I peeled off my soggy clothes and warmed up in a cold shower. I attempted to relax in bed, but my advancing state of starvation forced me back out into the rain. I dodged raindrops to a store where I found succor in a stale bag of Lay's potato chips again to stave off starvation for 90 minutes. Munching, more like chewing my cud, the stale chips, I slogged back to the river dock for a 55-gallon drum of Peruvian cerveza. As I enjoyed my pre-dinner appetizer and drank while fighting off a horde of bloodthirsty mosquitoes, I struck up a conversation with the two young men operating the town's shortwave radio, a primitive form of cell phone for my younger readers. I asked them to please call my boss, Elizabeth Vargas, to let her know I was in town and would need a boat the next morning to take me to Manu Wildlife Center, the eco-lodge where I was to teach English to the Indian staff for the next two months. They seemed nonplussed by my request. Elizabeth Vargas works in Cusco, not at the lodge, they informed me in Spanglish. Elizabeth herself had confirmed in Spanglish a few days earlier that she was indeed at the lodge and would be awaiting my arrival. What? Are you sure? 
they assured me in Spanglish that Elizabeth Vargas, whom I had been communicating regularly with for four months, lived and worked in Cusco. Your boss is named Kurtzita Racheta. I'm obviously changing the name here to protect the guilty and to protect myself from a libel lawsuit. Kurtzita Racheta, I asked, bewildered. Who the hell is Kurtzita Racheta? The two young men exchanged sly conspiratorial glances and failed in their attempts to hide their gleeful, malicious smiles that the stupid gringo in front of them had never heard of the legendary Kurtzita Racheta. She is the big boss woman at Manu Wildlife Center, one of them explained. With his hands, he drew in the air an outline of a large, imposing, and obviously female form. His companion at the radio mic cracked up, laughing at his buddy's pantomime. Well, whoever Kurtzita Rachida is or isn't, Please radio her and let her know I will be here at the dock tomorrow morning. They assured me my boat would arrive at 8 a.m. to take me to my rendezvous with the mysterious Kurtzita Racheta at the Ritzy Eco Lodge in the heart of the Peruvian Heart of Darkness. But that was tomorrow. Tonight, it was finally time to eat. I slogged back through the mud to Boca Manu's finest and only restaurant just as they were opening for dinner. The gracious host sat me down at his finest table, i.e. the one with the best view of his big screen color TV, which, which was then silent because the power had failed again. I asked the guy what kind of meat he served praying silently for a plate of steaming giant rat. No hay carne hoy día, solo vegetariano. There is no meat today, only vegetarian food. This news was about as welcome as a positive test for dengue fever at that point, but resisting their urge to throw a gringo carnivore temper tantrum, I assured him vegetariano would be just fine. He yelled something to his wife in the kitchen, then commenced to attending to the much more important task of breathing life into his giant TV, which got its signal from the new satellite dish on the tin roof and on the tin roofs of every other shack in the village. His efforts were rewarded when a 52-inch tall governor of California, dressed in black underwear and growling in Spanish, prepared to lay waste to about 200 terrorists on some remote island. The governor suited up and assembled his nuclear-powered bazooka that he just happened to be carrying in his backpack. Right about the time he mowed down his first terrorist, the proprietor's 14-year-old daughter brought me my long-awaited and much-anticipated vegetarian dinner, approximately five pounds of steamed rice topped by two scrambled eggs. And so, for the next ten minutes, I sat there forcing rice and eggs down my throat while the man and his teenage daughter sat there spellbound by the bazooka-wielding governor of California single-handedly taking down an entire battalion of well-armed terrorists while magically deflecting a rain of bullets much more effectively than my bazooka full of deet was warding off the rain of mosquitoes feasting off me for their own less than vegetarian dinner. It was 7.30 p.m. when I climbed under my mosquito net to crash, letting the soft sound of rain on palm leaves lullaby me 
into peaceful slumber. And assuming I am, uh, still have a camera going, we will wind up chapter 8, get ready to head to chapter 9, Lodged in the Jungle at Last, coming up next.